Indeed it's not working in prod. Well, it's not my problem. It works just fine on my machine and on the dev server. Well? Well, I told you all systems are ISOs. And if it's working in dev, it's working in prod. It's ISO? Oh, yeah. Essentially, I mean, pretty much almost. Almost? What do you mean, almost? Uh, you know, there's maybe a very small gap in minor versions. And for some plugins. Nothing particularly important. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. See people already in the chat? Hello? I always love to do this. If you want, sound off. Tell me where you're at in the world. We get people joining us from all over the world. It's pretty cool to see where everybody's at. I'm here in Austin, Texas. And today I have one of my favorite friends, Tim. How are you? Peter, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm, I'm awesome, man. Tell everybody, where, where are you from in the world? So I uh, am in Atlanta, Georgia. So, you know, kind of southeast of the United States. Not too terribly far from Austin, I suppose, when we think about this whole big world. Yeah, not 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 too far at all. Yeah. And it, it, is it hot there? They always call it hot Atlanta. It's yes. I mean, it's always hot. It's always hot, Peter. <laughs> but like this week in particular, I don't know what's it's it's hot and it's very humid and it's raining. It was like a steam bath outside yesterday. So and I'm looking outside. I have windows behind the camera here outside. It, it looks uncomfortably hot. They're, they're fogging up. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm happy to be in here. Happy to be on this. <laughs> yeah. AC is nice. Wonderful modern invention. Yes, but, uh, indeed. Yeah, well, so we jumped ahead, but Tim, tell us, tell us, uh, tell everybody who the, who you are and what you yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so Tim Vale, um, I head up the sales engineering team at Cockroach Labs. So, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with Cockroach. I suppose we can get into that in a little bit. But uh, I'll, you know, kind of before that, spent a lot of time in software development uh, in various engineering roles. Have kind of grew up uh, writing and building Java applications, and then got into kind of the data space, big data. Anyway, found my, found my way to Cockroach Labs. So it's been an interesting journey, but very familiar with kind of you know, full application lifecycle development stuff. So happy to be here because I'm a, a big fan of this kind of work. Awesome, awesome. So Java. So Java. Java dev. Yeah. Yes, Java, Spring, these, you know, these things yeah. that, I, I, you know, I think are still popular maybe a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's where I made my my living for many years. That's where you where you made your millions. Is yes, it? as you can see from the ceiling above <laughs> me, right? I mean, I, you know, we invested a lot. All that money I made has gone right into 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 the basement office here. Yeah, yeah, I I was a Java de uh, developer for a bit. I was um I was on the Microsoft side and yeah. doing C plus plus MFC and those type of things and painful. But I went to VB six. Ooh. And I, I, yeah, I mentioned VB6. Yeah, so everybody can make fun of me. I loved VB6. I, you know, I was doing line of business applications, inventory management, and building Windows apps, right? And it's just painful in C++, just painful. But uh, yeah, and then, and then Java came out. This is before .NET and the internets, you know, and I was like, ooh, this seems interesting. And so I bounced over to the Java world and the Linux world and yeah, I haven't looked back since. Yeah, you know, and 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 you actually had a, a decent journey. I, you know, I I didn't go to school to be a programmer. I, I went to school as a MIS and finance major, a dual major. Anyway, I, I did I think similar kind of stuff, like a Microsoft soft stack in school. My first job out of college, they're like, we need you to learn Java, and I picked up this Java book, and I'm like, please no. I mean, like literally crying at night, thinking I, I can't, I can't, I don't want to do this. This is awful. This looks awful. Uh, but it yeah. actually turned out great. I mean, you know, it's it's that whole ten thousand hours thing, right? I mean, you spend enough yeah. time doing anything, and it becomes it becomes familiar. And that was certainly the case for me with, with Java over the years. So it's it's kind of still my go to. Yeah, I, I know it doesn't make me cool. Uh, not many things do. But, um, <laughs> but that's it. Yeah, yeah. No, and you got to write. I remember writing a lot of XML. It's great. I'm uh, hey, I'm not beating yeah. up on Java, but I but I went to. I got fascinated with JavaScript around early two thousands when. Yeah. Gmail and and I think yeah. actually Maps came out first, right? With all the JavaScript in the browser, and I was like, "Whoa, wait a minute! What, yeah. what are you doing here? This is pretty cool, right?" And I got fascinated with JavaScript and started oh, writing yeah. a lot of JavaScript. And then all my Java and C plus plus friends all made fun of me. They're like, oh, "Is that a real language? Toy language?" Yeah, it is. It, it, it is. is. Don't let them do that to you. <laughs> it was hurtful. 
it was it took me yeah, years of therapy. <laughs> well, you know, back in the day, and I know we're probably getting off topic, but back in the day, it was all EJBs and all this back end stuff. And people are like, yeah. don't you want to be a back end Java developer? I'm like, no, not really. I want to yeah. kind of paint, paint pretty pictures on the screen and, and do HTML and JavaScript. So I always did the full stack stuff, right? I mean, it was yeah. a lot of front end all the way to the back end. I didn't want to be just that back end guy. That's yeah. not fun. Yeah, that, that's like me. I, I enjoy full stack for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm one of those programmers that, that understands CSS. Yes, right. like it's like yes. magic to a lot, a lot of folks, right? You and I are just like, brothers <laughs> from another mother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here. yeah, awesome. Okay, so let's jump. Let's jump into it. Today we're yeah. going to talk about containerizing databases. Yeah, absolutely. Super. And I get I get questions all the time. Should you? Should you not? You know, and if you do, what does that look like? Yeah. So. Well, so, yeah, you know, yeah I mean, you know, geez, the short answer is yes, of course you should. I mean, why wouldn't you, especially in, in development? And I think, um, you know, as I, as I grew up, as we were saying, kind of doing development, right? And it's funny, your video, I would not seen that, that, that little video. I mean, it's so true. My God, it's so true that, um, you know, you're building these applications and, and you've got some way to test uh, those applications against a database locally. You know, typically in, in the old days, so obviously it wasn't containers, but then you deployed this application out to production or UAT and it behaved totally differently. And it's like, what on earth? Yes. And a lot of times from a database perspective, that had to do with clustering or, you know, or some other kind of HA scenario, uh, which was always so perplexing. I mean, geez, it works so well here. But when I get out into the environment or into a production or production like environment, the back end, the database was configured very, very differently. And this was... Yeah such a challenge for you know the high scale applications we were uh, we were building so yes you know I, I think one of the great um the great reasons or or uh, benefits of docker is that i can build these kind of complex obviously application framework stack kind of things but you know when we're talking specifically about the database you know we can build you know and run kind of complex database or data storage environments in Docker, and I and it's fantastic. You know, we work or I work for CockroachDB. It's a clustered database, a database that scores store. Uh, excuse me, scales horizontally. You know, I can't do it, or I shouldn't do it, just on one node, right? It needs to be this this kind of you know bigger scalable environment. And doing right. that in Docker is so is so trivial, so easy to do. And so that's what you know. You'll see a lot of of the work that we do and talk about you know, with customers or prospects, it's all like, hey, go download this Docker Compose file. Let me show you how to run, you know, a clustered database in development, you know, in UAT, get a feel for that database before you move into production. Yeah, 100%. I, yeah, and, and what you're talking about works on my machine. That was like the prime oh. problem that Docker Docker attacked, right? It's it's like magical when I, you know, you download an image, you run it, you know, my uh, MySQL, whatever it is, right, Mongo, or, or just a message queue or anything, right? And you're like, oh, wait a minute. I didn't have to install that, configure it, compile stuff when you're dealing with open source. Right? It, just, it's just work. it just works, right? And yeah. Like yeah. And, and I think what, you know, what, what I'll show here in a minute as an example is, you know, the, the, the simple stuff is simple with Docker. You know, if I want to spin up a Postgres instance or a MySQL instance or Mongo instance, you can do that pretty simply. It's a one node thing, you know, a Docker image, ah, you know, that's, that's okay, but I think the beautiful thing about it is it can make the complex stuff simple too. And so, yeah. you know, you look at a database like Cockroach or even some of the other databases that are out there that require more than just one thing, you know, it just makes it so simple. Yeah, yeah. We love, we obviously love Compose here, right? It's that glue that kind of stitches everything together. I hate, you know, I'm trying not to, when I when I talk about Compose, not use Compose in the definition, I have like a, a maybe a fifth grade teacher that used to beat you up, right? You can't use the word in the definition, right? You know, yeah. compose composes your app. I don't know, yeah. stitches it together. I don't know, you know, but it, you know, but that's the benefit of it. And I, maybe should I share my screen now? I'll just kind yeah. of walk you through yeah. what uh, some of the stuff I like to look at. We'll just do a quick compose file. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so there's me, there's us, there's an infinite, little, infinite little inception infinite inception. So I just thought maybe you can see my my uh, screen, I assume at this point, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, so I, I, again, and and we talked about a little bit about this at DockerCon, but I think it might be worth just kind of like my philosophy about about Docker Compose specifically and, yeah. and as it relates to running a database. I mean, I, I love the simplicity of sharing a Compose file. You know, I, I don't want to, and, and 
it's important, I guess, to describe why why we do so much sharing. I mean, you know, we're out here trying to talk about this this new and interesting database, and people want to get it up and running quickly. I don't want to have to send them this big bundle of things that they've got to piece together in order to run. You know, so a prospect will say, hey, you know, can you share an example? I want to share one thing. I want to share one simple right. thing. And so what I like to do is share a compose file. I don't have a bunch of extra configuration, extra files or binaries. I want to share one thing. And I want that one thing to be intelligent enough to spin up the entire cluster for Cockroach. And so what you see here, you know, Cockroach, this is a quick side note requires kind of three nodes to get running in any kind of meaningful way. And so this compose file, it really does, it doesn't do a whole lot, but it's all right here in front of you. And that is, I spin up three nodes, you know, CRDB0, that's the first name, the node. I spin up the second node, I spin up the third node. You know, maybe the interesting thing, you know, for, for CockroachDB, more familiar folks is, you know, I, I've got to tell each node which, which to join. So it's, you know, essentially what I'm saying is each node, node join the first, but it's really simple, simple command to start a node um, across three services. And then what I do, and we can maybe spend a little bit of time talking about some of this is CockroachDB at least, um, it's not required by any stretch of the imagination, but we like to encourage folks to, to front the cluster with a load balancer. In, in this case, I use HA proxy. There are other things that you could do. And so I spin up a service, which is nothing more than a, essentially a wrapper around HA proxy. And then I do a couple other little things here. I initialize the database. So I have a kind of a sidecar, if you will. There's probably, a, and you could correct me here, like some official uh, Docker name for this. But, um, you know, it's just a it's, a, it's a container that spins up, does something to the other services, and then disappears. Yeah. And then for the purposes of this example, I have something called workload client, which just runs um, a whole bunch of load at the system. But this is it, right? I refer to images. I don't refer to other Docker files. You know, I'm not asking you to, to go do or, or build some external configuration file. It's kind of all right here. And this is how I like to, to get things up and running. And nice. it's already up and running, by the way. Uh, but I, I'll just pause there. Any, anything about this looks strange, unusual? Have I done something wrong, Peter? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you, you passed him. No, I did. No, I, no, I mean, I think you hit on the beautiful part, right? It's what you're doing is very complex, but yeah. the file is super simple, right? And it's easy to to reason about very, very simply, right? And I love the load balancer of putting the HA proxy. Maybe we could dive a little bit more into that later, but yeah, and and the idea of that sidecar. Yeah, we don't have a, like a an official term, kind of like the Kubernetes, yeah. but yeah. I get that question all the time, right? Should I, should I, and I think we have one in here in the, one here in the chat, but yeah, map a DV volume or keep it in Git, right? Should I put code in, you know, data in Git and then load it up? Should I have a volume that I share around and, and attach to the volume? You know, the, like all good answers, right? It depends, right? It yeah. Depends. Yeah, yeah you thinking. know, and, and I, you know, certainly I, I don't consider myself like, you know, a, a Docker expert by any means. I think I said this in, in the presentation I did a while ago. But, you know, this is kind of this is how I have gotten kind of comfortable with the technology. And I, I would suspect, as, as people are probably rightly pointing out, you know, there are different and better ways to do it. But this seems this seemed easy. And one of the things I'll, you, you kind of mentioned HA proxy. So one of the, the HA proxy obviously has lots of published Docker containers. What I tried to do here, because what you'll notice is the image is not a, like a standard image. It's one that I have, um, that I've kind of built and published. But what it does is it tries to build the HA proxy configuration file kind of at runtime or at load time, as opposed to, you know, what you often see for those of you who use HA proxy in other places, you know, I've got to, I've got to essentially create a, a config file and maybe I load it into the container or I make it available via a volume out here. I wanted to kind of, I wanted to do all configuration via environment variables that I pass to this wrapper image. Um, and, and by the way, this is also a, a, a GitHub project, this dynamic HA proxy uh, little image that I published. And you can see all it is really, and again, I, maybe you, my, you and your viewers might call this out, it's like this horrible, cheap, dirty hack, but what is it? I mean, it's, it's an entry point, you know, shell script, which before it actually runs HA proxy, Kind of goes through this process of interpreting or or um or reading environment variables and then using those environment variables to dynamically 
you know, essentially write this file to this um, this image's disk. And so you can see here, you know, I'm, I'm essentially catting, you know, the HA proxy config and building it in real time from these environment variables. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I like that. It makes it um, it makes it portable, right? Set yeah, your well, environment the, variables. Yeah, that's the idea. And you know, maybe that's a good point. You know, that that I think. Is, is worth mentioning certainly about like the examples I'm showing. The idea for behind a lot of what I, I've done here and I'm showing here is not that this is the most performant way, you know, that this is the most elegant way, but this is a nice, simple, self-contained way to get up and running with this database. Right. You know, so could I, could this be, oh yes. I mean, we could do a hundred different things here, but this was, I think I want to make it self-contained. I want to make it easy. I want it to be easy to reason about, you know, yeah. about how you do this. And so that's what we do here. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll just keep kind of going about what some of these services are. So same kind of thing like this cockroach init sidecar. Um, and, and again, people may make fun of me here, but um, I, as we, we stated earlier, I, you know, I come from a Java background. And so what I tried to do in this particular instance was the cockroach Docker image, the cockroach database Docker image by default, unlike some other databases, by the way, doesn't provide a facility for initialization. Like we don't have a way to specify, hey, start this, you know, Docker data or this uh, cockroach database and, and add this user or create this default database. We just, it's just not part of our Docker image builds. So I created this kind of remote client sidecar kind of thing that takes a whole bunch of information out of the environment variables and does that kind of initialization that you might expect from uh, th that you might have seen with other databases. And just because I knew it well, and again, maybe shame on me, I created a Spring Boot application that, you know, so this, um, you know, this particular container is really a Spring Boot app running inside like a Java container, Java-based container that again, pulls in all of these environment variables um, and then executes the right kind of commands on an instance of cockroach running in client mode um, to get the database set up. So again, it's kind of complex. There's some complexity here, but my, you know, my goal is shield the kind of the end user from some of that complexity by simply referring to an image that does a lot of that heavy lifting, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. Cool. So, so when you go, go yeah, ahead. No, 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 Peter, please. No, I, I was gonna, I was just gonna dive in we're talking about how the how the clustering works and how you write yeah. to one and you know th those type of things, but yeah, j j don't don't let me uh, well, throw your flow off here. Well, uh, so what I was going to say is, so you know, I, I'd already started this up and running or this uh, this particular cluster uh, before we started. So just uh, I'll just kind of quickly jump over to this example. And by the way, all these examples are on GitHub, uh, which we can certainly share in the chat. But uh, I'm looking at the compose file here. I have this you know little up. Uh, shell script, which which already started the cluster. But what I was going to do is just kind of bounce over, um, if I can, to the UI. And so, you know, here I've got this cluster up and running. It's this it's cockroach database cluster up and running. Those are the three services. Everything's healthy. Everything's running. Everything's settled down. I thought what would be, be interesting is to start to run some work on this cluster and then just show you how easy it is to test failure scenarios yeah. with Docker and kind of how Cockroach responds to that, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds great. So before I do that, I just thought I'd also show, you know, HA proxy has a UI. It's kind of, again, nice when you're testing uh, both, you know, running in a healthy state, but also running, you know, potentially in a, in a damaged state. And here you can see like all three nodes, CRDB012, everything's healthy, everything's fine. There's not really any activity on the cluster. And I know I'm not giving a full introduction to what we're looking at here, but just take my word for it. There's not much happening here. So if I shift over to this, um, to the command line here, I'm gonna run an exec command, which should look familiar to most people. And all this is doing is it's actually calling um, a workload command that's built into the cockroach binary. What is that? Well. Anybody who wants to kind of play around with Cockroach, you know, the first thing they're going to want to do is, is create a, a schema and, and, and do something with that. And so instead of relying on the end user to go figure that out, we've built in this nice binary, which will create a schema, run a bunch of work on it just to get a feel for, you know, um, 
for actual work happening in the database. So I'm going to paste this in, and this is going to, assuming um, you know a live demo actually works, is going to create a schema, and you can see some of the um, uh, some of the log messages passing by. What's happening is essentially um, a, a database table has been created, or series of tables, and data is being loaded into that. And then I'm going to give that just a few seconds to complete, and I'm going to run or execute the actual running of the workload. So, so actual work now starting to, to hit the database. And so nice. if we switch back over, you can see, all right, you know, and think about just like kind of pull this back to where we started, right? I want to test kind of simply the behavior of my application locally. You know, I'm not doing it against a single instance node. I'm doing it now against a three node cluster, something that would look and feel a lot like what I might see in production. And a very common use case for this kind of testing for us at Cockroach is injecting failure and seeing how, you know, the database and how the application behaves. So before I, I do that, just want to, you know, hey, look, I see stuff running, right? S SQL statements are being executed. There's some updates, there's some inserts, there's some deletes happening in the database. And you can see that, again, all my nodes are live. I have three live nodes. I have ranges. We won't get into any of that stuff. But um, And you can see the workload is running, right? I mean, things are happening in the database. So behind the scenes, what I'm going to do, assuming I have this somewhere easily in my history, which I should, I better, is I'm going to stop a node. So I'm just going to Docker Compose stop one of the nodes, kill one of the nodes in the cluster. And I want to see kind of how things behave. And so hopefully things will behave well, Peter. They will, they will, I have full, full confidence. Full confidence. So node is stopped. And if I flip back here, I start to see things a little different, right? My database is, or Cockroach is saying, you know what, a node is down, something's happened, it's not responding. Um, I have under replicated ranges, which we won't get into, it's kind of beyond the scope. But basically this is saying is, whoops, two out of three things are now missing. But the key thing here is that, and this is the beauty of Cockroach, but it's also the beauty of, of, of being able to run and test an environment like Compose. The beauty here is the work hasn't stopped, right? So I've lost a third of my cluster and yet I'm continuing to serve reads and writes. And if I flip back over to this workload generator, sure enough, I'm still you know, proceeding with, in this particular case, it's a workload called TPCC, you know, I'm still, I'm still serving reads and writes, I'm still processing orders. And this is a great thing. I mean, this is, this is designed to survive, this application, this workload is designed to survive interruptions, but other environments or other applications that you may be wanting to test locally would not. And this is a great way to understand what that behavior looks like locally. Nice. And I just got a milkshake delivered. Um, <laughs> awesome. I don't know if, if everybody else saw that. I didn't because I'm staring at my screen. But my daughter um, was kind enough to deliver me a milkshake, which I will not drink on the live stream. But it's sitting here. I'm a, I'm a little jealous. I could go for a milkshake. I know. That's I know. Nice. It's, it's, yeah. it's Arby's. It's a Jamocha shake. I don't know if that's popular, <laughs> but uh, that's what I that's what I have uh, waiting for me when we're done here, Peter. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I mean, so that's kind of it. I you know this is. This is cockroach running. This is cockroach running in the midst of failure. This is how we oftentimes, you know, create these um, these environments and start to break them in lots of lots of different ways. Yeah, that, that, yeah. I think one of the big things we're trying to, you know, big difficulty right with engineering is like you pointed out, you have production environments that are way different than how you develop locally. Even your test environments, it's really hard to get test environments very wow. similar to production test data. Right, but with with Docker and Compose, you can start bringing those all locally to your machine. Do things like this: shut down a node in the cluster. Right, what happens to my application? Am I still able to write? Am I still able to save data? Am I losing data? And you know, how does how does my app perform against um, you know an HA database? Right, and you're able to do that all locally as a developer who owns that code talking to the database. Right. Yeah, it, it's just so powerful. I mean, you know, here I've shared one file, right? And what did I get? I got a three node cluster fronted by a load balancer and a workload generator that creates a bunch of traffic and sends it to that database. You know, that's a lot of complexity packed into a simple file. And you're so right. I mean, you know, it's really easy. And I think all developers would agree with this. It's easy to build for the perfect scenario, for the, 
you know, the 80% uh, when right. things are running well. And I think one of the things that's so easy about this, and also, by the way, what's so nice about Cockroach is, you know, what happens when catastrophe hits? What happens when things start to fail? How does my application behave? How does my database behave? Um, and it's just not, you know, maybe pe folks are getting better, but it's funny. We, we talk with customers day in and day out, and it's, it's surprising. You know, they're, this is a hard problem to solve. This is a difficult thing to inject into kind of local development, certainly, or kind of, you know, development that's closer to the developer as opposed to UAT or production. Uh, but this makes it so easy. And, and, and we just, we can't encourage people enough. When you're, you know, when you're looking at a new database, when you're, building a new application, make sure, you know, as early as you can test how these things behave under these weird circumstances, because everybody gets the easy stuff, right? It's the hard stuff that um, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it just a nice, beautiful thing about this, too, that you mentioned it really early, but I, I just wanted to circle back to it is all these images are living on Hub, right? And that's your that's your yes. central repository where you can all your developers can share the same place. You're using the same image, right? We're, we're tagging here to latest, right? We're pulling latest, but that's, that's for demonstration purposes, right? You Correct. Would, you would pin to a specific version, right? That all your developers, everybody's using, right? And it's all just shared through hub, right? It you is. It, right. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, it, and it's just, it's, it's a really, it's a big personal preference of mine to be able to do that again, you know, and let's take Docker, uh, excuse me, um, HA proxy, for example, and, and again, maybe there's a better way that I just hadn't discovered, but the way I used to do this before I shared this wrapper on Docker Hub was that I would just use the default HA proxy image. And in addition to passing around this compose file, I'd be passing around this hard coded HA proxy config file that made sense for this particular configuration. It just felt bulky. You know, it was like now instead of one thing, I've got actually it was it was three things. It was the config file and this marked up Docker file that I had created that extended a, the HA proxy base file. So it was like, you know, hey, you want to get something up and running? Sure. Here, did you download these three things? And it right. just became difficult. And so I made a, a real concerted effort in all of our examples to move every single thing to Docker Hub, you know, and configure those things to the best of my ability using environment variables as opposed to some other mechanism. Again, in this desire for simplicity during development. Would you yeah. want to do this in production? Yeah, you know, I don't know. But, um, you know, in development, this is the way uh, I, I, it just it makes it so much easier to do. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. That allows you to use that that verified content at Hub and then, you know, I use the object oriented analogy a lot. You know, a lot of our, a lot of our viewers are uh, Java developers and um, you know, so an image you can use as a base class almost, right? You're going to use all of that. Yeah. The goodness that's in there. Right. And then just like you did, you, you extended that class, you extended that image and put the bits on top. That well, that's needed, it. Right. In yeah. fact, here, like here's the, you know, here's the Docker file, right. For HA proxy. What did I do? I just, I took it from the parent. Yep. Right. And then I do a little update, which, I, you know, I'd, I'd be curious if that's still recommended, but I do it anyway. Yeah. And then I take the Docker file that I want this image to reference. I add it in and then I just update the entry point to make sure that it's calling my new um, entry point SH. And what does that do is we kind of just briefly, you know, showed earlier. This is where I'm scraping the environment variables to grab some of that important stuff to help me write out this config file in real time. Yeah. And nice. then we do all that and HA proxy then just goes on its way and starts up like it normally would, you know, just calls exec, you know, yeah. and, and whatever had been passed in. So this is the kind of stuff I really like to do because what I had done before, as I was saying is I was having to share this Docker file with you. I was having to share this other thing with you and it just became, it became complicated. I don't like complicated. I can't handle yeah. it. My brain doesn't process <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you kind of say it tongue in cheek, right? But, but yeah, it's true, right? The simpler you can keep things for folks, the easier it is to, you know, the less you have to learn about all these other things while you have all this other stuff in your head you're trying to develop, right? So if you, you know, the barrier to entry, even if it's a black box, right? That's the, oh, it just works for me. That, yeah. That's and, beauty, you know, right? and same thing, like, you know, just, I, we kind of skimmed over it earlier, but same kind of thing with, um, 
with this remote client, which is that sidecar. And this is actually kind of cool because this is one of the things I really liked. It was a, a fairly recent, or at least it was recent to me, kind of um, capability in Docker, and that's that multi-stage build, right? Yeah. So yeah. here I'm saying, all right, I've got really kind of two binaries that I want to build from. One is I want to um, I want to use just you know a Java a Java image that has JDK J, the JDK that I'll use, and then I also, by the way want to grab the cockroach binary, right? And then I'm going to kind of grab pieces of both of those things, this Java builder image and the cockroach image to build kind of this final image that is actually going to run and launch my Spring Boot application. And so, you know, again, maybe not the world's greatest multi-stage build example, but that's a really powerful thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And makes, you know, development again, so much simpler. Um, yeah. And oh, by the way, I don't know if other folks, you said you got a lot of Java folks using um, on the show. You know, this is IntelliJ. And IntelliJ, in one of their more recent releases, kind of built in some really nice support for multi-stage builds uh, within Docker uh, or for Docker. And so you get some kind of syntax highlighting and some other things that you didn't get before, yeah. uh, which I think is kind of neat. Yeah. No, I, I I agree. You know, you, you can get complex with your multi-stage builds, but the concepts, the concepts are there, right? Do do your work, whatever that needs to be in different stages, and then pull those into your mm -hmm. image at the end and, and follow that best practice of only putting what you need in the image to run, right? And leave yep. everything else for security reasons, size of image reasons, maintainability, all those type of things, right? Yep. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Well, um, so folks out on the, on, a, on the interwebs that are watching, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat. We have, uh, let's see, we have some questions in here. We, we have one that's not related to Docker, but we could take a look here. So what's the ideal size of the image should be if we want to deploy to Kubernetes? Hmm. Uh, you know, that's that's, um, that's that's an interesting discussion, right? And I don't think there, there's no, in, at least in my opinion, right? There's no uh, ideal size. Ideally, you want it to be as small as necessary to do what it needs to do. Right, kind of talking about the multi-stage uh, builds there. Right, you only want to put. First of all, you want your image to be single-threaded. Right, only one process. Right, make sure you're not putting two processes in inside of an image, just like Tim was showing in his example. Right, you could have put that little worker image right that loads up the database. You might have put it in one of the other uh, database images, and you know that's probably not the best place to do it. So you have your database running, and then you have this worker that runs underneath it and there are two processes inside that image, right? And then what image do you manage? What process do you manage inside that image? If it dies, does that mean the container dies? So the principle to follow the uh, you know 12 factors, keep it simple, only yeah. put one process inside of a container, yeah. right? And only add what you need to that container uh, to run, right? And that should keep your image size as small as possible. So. I'm not sure if that's exactly the answer you're looking for, but that is kind of my general answer to that question. And that just doesn't apply to Kubernetes, right? That that can apply to any any runtime. Yeah, and I'll say this too, like, you know, from a Cockroach DB perspective, it's something we keep our eye on pretty closely. Like we want our image to be pretty small. It's grown a little bit lately and then it actually shrank and then it's growing again. But anyhow, you know, we try to keep it, keep the size down uh, because you know, when you're dealing with a highly clustered environment like we are, you know, you may have um, deployment pipelines or other infrastructures code that's, you know, needs to go quickly grab a new binary or new image and, and redeploy, especially in an environment like Kubernetes where things can come up and down. So we want we want the kind of the tax on the network to be pretty low or as low as possible. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of intelligence packed in this stuff. So it's, you know, it, it's not ever going to go to zero. But I think we do work hard, as, as all people should, I think, to keep those images uh, reasonably well sized so that you yeah. can move things in and out. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Francesco has joined us, one of our new Docker captains. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, here's a here's a decent question. I really kind of like this question. And of course, it it could it's it's very yeah. complex. But I'll I'll throw this over to you, Tim. Let yeah, you so answer I, this. Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked this because I saw this in the chat. And I'm like, oh, I'd like to answer that. Um, so yeah. let let me set the stage just briefly, kind of. So so Cockroach, a distributed, traditional relational SQL engine. Uh, we implement the Postgres wire protocol. So I mentioned Postgres, and folks have probably been using Postgres in Docker forever. 
uh, your Postgres drivers will work to connect to Cockroach. Uh, so it's very Postgres-like, but it's a distributed database. And so the question here is really important. Like, how, you know, how, do this, how does clustering and replication work? But most importantly, uh, it, you know, can I write to any and every node? And the answer is yes, with Cockroach you can. That's why actually you saw the use of a simple HA round robin load balancer. Any write request or a write request could go to any of those nodes and be served. And so that it gets to the heart of how Cockroach is architected. But the simple answer is that any node in a Cockroach cluster is the same, means it uses the same binary, runs uh, or exposes the same two ports, and is capable of reading and writing. That's why our topology in something like this is so simple. Three nodes and a load balancer, because any any node in the system can perform the same work. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, awesome. Uh, let's see. My application is inside uh, a Docker container. Then I bow access from the outside. Oh, you ban access from the outside. Yep, perfect. That really depends on what kind of um, you know what kind of networking you need. Do you need to, to expose your application, your resources, your database to the outside network? Yeah, you know, and then I go back and forth on this too, just in my own testing. Like I'll have my application, I'll have my cluster in Docker and Docker and Compose, and I'll just run my application, you know, inside of IntelliJ and test and kind of hit outside. Sometimes I want to bundle my application uh, as a container also and run it in kind of the same you know, the same Compose or, or network structure that the rest of the cluster is running in. You can do it either way. It really comes down to my, you know, as you're doing local development kind of personal preference. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, perfect. Well, awesome. Uh, there we go. This is another, uh, we got a little cockroach. Does you, does cockroach db does. support joins? It does. So um, it is, and I don't know who Kirk Douglas is. I'm, I'm reading ahead and trying to get <laughs> yeah, that. Is. I'm is, glad you saw that in the. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that means. But anyway, uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it just again, relational database, right? Traditional relational database. That's what Cockroach is going to look and feel like. In fact, it's going to look, as I said, most like a, um, a Postgres database. So, tables, rows, columns, primary and secondary indexes, joins, you know, just native ANSI SQL, we support. So, very, very powerful traditional relation database. It just so happens, Peter, it was built kind of from the ground up to be this distributed engine, um, which is kind of neat and exciting. Written in Go, by the way, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about Java, but CockroachDB is written in Go, which I know nothing about, which is is unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, lo I love Go. Uh, the en Docker engine is written in Go. All of our tools are written in Go. Is uh, that right? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, we do a ton of ton of go. It's it's I can read it really well, but to sit down and build something from scratch, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not there yet. But I can I I can read it pretty well, uh, you know, and edit and. Uh, um, but yeah, it's very it's a very interesting language coming from other C based languages, right? You can mm -hmm. understand it pretty well, but then there's those, um, you know, go routines and all those type of stuff that that uh, you know throw me for a loop when I some of the syntax I'm like wait a minute, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, but, uh, it's, yeah, it's very powerful though, yeah. Yeah, it's tough, and I, so I'm trying to learn it. I actually, I ordered the book on Amazon and then they sent me two um, of the same book. So I have two copies, one in different places of the house. I'm trying to like absorb Go as a language, but I just I just haven't gotten there. Yeah, well tell me, tell me what, what are you excited about in the industry? What are you excited about databases, maybe something you guys are doing or just, just some folks out in the world that are, um, and it could be anything, Tim, I, I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts. I mean, yeah, there's a lot. Um, you know, the database, is, and we're starting to see this more and more, databases has turned into a really, really hot market. Um, you know, you, you're seeing it with some of the press announcements, some of the valuations, some of the funding rounds. There's a lot of happening in database, even database technologies that a couple of years ago you didn't hear a lot about, but existed are now are becoming uber powerful. So I think there's just this, there is this um, resurgence in interest, I think, in, in databases. And I think that's partially because Technology has really evolved since they were first created. You know, Oracle starting, you know, 40 plus years ago. A lot's changed in the game. Yeah, can you imagine that? I mean, 40 years? Something like that. It's crazy. Wow. It's been around, you know, these some of these technologies have been around for a very long time. Yeah. And so yeah. I think, you know, what's interesting or exciting to us at Cockroach is that the kind of the new innovation and, um, and capability that's now available as technology 
has advanced. I mean, Cockroach was built from the ground up to be a distributed SQL engine as opposed to starting as a traditional monolithic um, engine that, you know, is now trying to be distributed. So, it, you know, it really has kind of changed the game. And I think, you know, the natural extension of that is, and we're seeing this play out in the market is, is people are, are, you know, they just, they want to run not just a database in a handful of containers in a local environment, but they want to run it in the cloud and not just in a single availability zone, but across multiple, multiple availability zones, multiple regions. We're even seeing folks wanting to run Cockroach database, a single logical database across multiple cloud providers. Interesting. And so, yeah. so the kind of the things that you can start to do with a, a single global logical database is really, really interesting. In fact, one of the things we start to talk about, you don't you just, Again, these are things that you may not think about, like the database almost as a global CDN. You know, CDNs are something that we talk a lot about in, you know, storing images and static files. But what if my database started to behave like that, that could yeah. you know, exist kind of out in the far reaches of the world and be strongly consistent and always available? And so we're doing some really neat things there uh, to enable that both in, in an on-prem world, but also in the cloud. And so there's just a lot of, a lot of excitement in Cockroach, not only about the interest in general that the, the database market is getting, but just kind of where the market is going in this kind of ubiquitous, always on, always available kind of environment. It's pretty neat. Hard yeah. to keep up with, but it's neat. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I think the data space is, is super interesting to me, right? It's um, spent the last couple of years collecting all this data streams and databases and everything, and, and now access to that and getting answers to your business out of that database. and and moving that data closest to where the users are, right? So that's that's very interesting of clustering a cl across clouds, right? Yeah, we're seeing it play out, you know, for, and, and just as a quick note, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is, you know, the cloud providers themselves have outages. They do, yeah. you know, there's, there, and some of them very well known. And so doing it across multiple providers kind of keeps you resilient to cloud provider failure, but it also gives you kind of a bargaining chip. Like, hey, you know, I'm not all in on you guys. You know, I've got stuff over here too. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so we're seeing more and more customers move in that direction, more and more prospects. Awesome. Uh, awesome. It's, yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Tell, tell, tell everybody where, if they want to reach out to you, connect with you, where's uh, LinkedIn, right? It's LinkedIn, Peter. I wish I was one of these, these cool guys who was on all these <laughs> other platforms. I'm just not, as you and I talked about, I don't, I don't, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not in all these other places. I probably should be, but uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. I'd love to hear from you. Happy to connect. Um, you know, happy to take questions there. Certainly reach out. Always, always happy to talk about uh, cockroach or Docker, whatever's on top awesome. of it. Glad to do it. Awesome. And uh, make sure you check out Tim's talk from, from DockerCon. Uh, it was a great talk. You can uh, watch that for free if you want a little bit more details, right? And also go check out uh, Cockroach Labs, their free tier. Uh, try it out, play around with it, uh, reach out to Tim, complain to him, yell at him, you know, give yes. him, you know, send him private messages on LinkedIn, harass him. No, but in all seriousness, you know, reach out, download it, give it a shot, take a look at the repo. I'm not able to put the link um, on the screen for the GitHub repo, but I'll put that in the show notes. So you can go out, you can look at the compose file, you can uh, take it for a test run. Um, yeah, and then also reach out to me, right? If you have any questions, you wanna talk more, love to hear from people, would love to hear how you're using Docker, what's missing, what what you would like to work better, right? In your dev flow, in your inner loop as you're working, uh, please reach out. Another uh, great place to, to connect with people in the community, the Docker community is, is go to our Docker community. We have meetups all around the world, we have, um, uh, you know, our Slack, you'll be able to join our Slack there and our forums, be able to connect. A lot of our engineers are on Slack. All of our uh, product managers are on Slack um, so they can interact with you. And then last but not least, but I think one of the most important things is check out our roadmap, right? If you want to get involved in, or just at least see where Docker is going, what we're building, um, jump in there, add a feature request, search for feature requests. Uh, join in the discussions right there, right there in, in GitHub. There's a lot of great discussions going on around features we're building, future features. Um, and that is our roadmap. We do use that. The company looks at that all the time. So great place to join in on the conversation. But yeah, again, Tim, thank you so much. We'll definitely have to have you back. Hey, talk Peter, more databases. 
Awesome, man. Stay, stay nice and cool there and enjoy your milkshake. We will take this, is this nice milkshake waiting for how obvious was it, by the way, on camera? I couldn't tell because I was looking at the screen. It, did she just kind of appear out of nowhere? It, it was it was quick. She was in and she was right, out right, and, and you had a milkshake. It was it was magical. That's the beauty of working at home and, and going live. Right. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Awesome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us, asking questions and uh, make sure to come back next Thursday. Thanks, everybody.